I just wanted to mention that this, uh, this uh, part of the slide that you see on the top left is, uh, is a sculpture in my hometown in Derry in the north of Ireland. And it symbolizes hands across the divide. And I uh, always put it in my slides because I feel that any effort these days to promote social justice and tolerance among people in this age of COVID and so on uh, is to be recognized. And I feel very strongly that this, is a, this symbolizes this crossing of boundaries. Um, so uh, uh, Arvind uh, uh, gave me a charge. Uh, uh, Arvind and I both like cricket, as he mentioned. And so uh, this is Kumar to Kelso. Uh, in some early uh, discussions we had, and this is what Ar Arvind said, I was thinking if you can do a general lecture on how dynamical systems provide a powerful framework to understand the brain and behavior, that's what he would like me to do. And since he's the boss and he's the bowler here, uh, and I thought it was going to be the last lecture, but I'm delighted that uh, Stan Grillner will follow and we can discuss things, it'd be great. Uh, uh, he tells me to be a bit easy on math and more strong on concepts. So uh, just as a warmer up for here, uh, I like this little quote from Huda Akil uh, about testifying to the US Congress a few years ago. Uh, we need to identify the dancers, uh, identify the nature of the dance and uncover how disease disrupts it well, this is ancient uh, knowledge, of course, to understand the sounds of the drum, you need to know the drummer and the drum itself. And this is really what this talk in a way will be about. Uh, further uh, along the same lines, here's Paul Allen, uh, I guess the late Paul Allen now and Francis Collins, who's the director of NIH in a piece at the Wall Street Journal. Today, we know that neurons fire, we know that they're connected. We don't know how they act in concert to govern behavior. And that's an essential question. Uh, I like this uh, quote uh, from Francis Crick. It's a few years old, of course, I call it the Crick conjecture. Uh, 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 Crick says, uh, the discovery that the brain was run physically would probably constitute a major breakthrough. And that, as you'll see, uh, both when uh, Stan talks and in some of my discussion here, that this notion of the brain running physically is not quite correct, but it's a very decent guess. It was kind of based on, uh, this is from Science Magazine a few years ago, this result that uh, in the visual cortex of, uh, of monkeys and anesthetized monkeys, actually. Not, actually, this was anesthetized cats, I should say. Uh, you see this neural synchrony between local field potentials and uh, single units. And it's around the 30 Hertz range, of course, the gamma frequency. I think this view, of, <laughs> uh, this, the editors of science thought enough of it to call it the mind revealed, uh, is probably too rigid but nevertheless uh, displays, I think, an element of uh, truth here. Um, of course, we know when we come to the brain that uh, it's full of rhythms and uh, for all kinds of things. Uh, I won't go into this at all, but uh, you'll recognize the hippocampal rhythms for memory and uh, uh, beta rhythms, alpha, they're, they're all given Greek names. Uh, so there's something that would suggest that rhythms, which will be really the focus of the, this talk and, and the, the one following, um, are, are pretty central to understanding the nervous system. Now, I, I like this quote from Yori Grizaki and the late Walter Freeman. Uh, not everyone agrees with the critical importance of brain oscillations, but everyone acknowledges that neuronal activity should be coordinated across neurons and structures. Oscillatory rhythms appear to be the best candidate for this coordination role. Uh, 
that's, I think, a good guess as well. Uh, although I, I think the rhythms themselves, the, the oscillations themselves are perhaps not as uh, significant here for understanding the problem, which is namely how these oscillations are coordinated. So I've put this in for the students here just as a, as a probe, uh, what we mean by understanding anything, just for you to think about, this is, that's all that this slide is about. And with a little provocation, what, what does it mean to understand a phenomenon at any level of description that you choose? Uh, this, the decline of mechanism actually goes back into the 30s and 40s in the history of physics. And this is Steven Weinberg. I think you can see him, the late Steven Weinberg, great uh, uh, particle physicist. Uh, in his book, Dreams of a Final Theory, he says matter has lost its central role. This role has been usurped by principles of symmetry. And uh, the venerable doctrine of mechanism, the idea that nature operates through pushes and pulls of material particles, the idea that natural phenomena have mechanical causes has stood in opposition to popular beliefs in gods and demons. It seems unlikely that this old, naive, mechanical worldview will be resurrected. Mechanism seems safely dead. Now, I will come back to this uh, uh, because I think if you're working in this field and you're starting in this field, it's a good idea to ask yourself what you really mean to understand a phenomenon that you're interested in. And actually, this is the gist of my talk. A TOC here will stand for theory of coordination. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a set of postulates, uh, some of which have been fairly well established, some are less so. And I'm going to... Uh, add a slide or two to show you that these postulates are reasonable. So I'm just, my idea here is uh, on a conceptual and empirical basis to introduce you here to a theory of coordination. And uh, one postulate, there are new laws of coordination. I'm just going to list these. I'll come back to them. There are new laws of coordination in living things. I mentioned earlier how coordination was so important and wasn't the only one. Unlike the laws of matter and motion in inanimate matter, these laws describe the flow of coordination states produced by functional synergies, or they've also been called coordinative structures. These synergies are the joint product of two forces, uh, self-organization and synergistic selection, namely evolution, and constitute the significant units of biological coordination at all scales. Coordination states on any given level of description are defined in terms of what we call collective variables or order parameters that typically span traditional boundaries between the organism and the environment. There's no duality here. These collective variables wrap up the degrees of freedom between stimuli and responses and so on. And these collective variables and order parameters and control parameters, these, these concepts here, have to be identified in complex living systems. And that's really a research agenda that can occur really at whatever level of description you decide to explore. The flow of coordination states produced by these functional synergies is written in, in the language, a mathematical language of informationally coupled self-organizing systems, namely coordination dynamics. Prominent features of the coordination dynamics are multi-stability, phase transitions, and in particular metastability, which I'll discuss a little bit. The new laws are scale independent, and this is based on recent results. They apply to the coordination of very many things, just a few things, and actually everything in between. That's uh, uh, an area for much further study, of course. Among other aspects, the laws address coordination within and between bodies and brains, between organisms and their environment, between humans and machines, in case of uh, human dynamic clamp and so on, between humans and other species, as say in riding a horse and all of that kind of thing. The laws are extensible and can handle adaptation and learning. And come to the last two, what we call agency or directedness uh, will be seen to emerge from the intra or interaction of the organism and the environment spanned by these collective variables. The most primitive form of self-organization known in biological coordination, brains included, uh, namely phase transitions, the idea, 
is that this phase transitions give rise to the notion of I or self, and that will be a claim that has both experimental and theoretical support. And this last part is perhaps a little bit more on philosophy and science. Actually, I see philosophy and science not at odds at all. Philosophy is the love of wisdom. Uh, science is the pursuit of knowledge. These things are uh, part and parcel of, this, of, of our understanding of nature. Metastability is an expression of the full complexity of brains and people and gives rise to a plethora of complementary pairs, such as individual, collective, competition, cooperation, segregation, integration. These are not either ors. The metastable, the metastable uh, dynamic shows that they're not either ors. They are coexisting tendencies. And I think that this kind of signals in the broader scheme of things that the, the normal dichotomies we create and contrarieties, as Samuel Beckett said, may have to re be replaced with far more subtle and sophisticated complementarities. Okay, so the first one, new laws to be expected in the organism. What are the new laws of? Actually, new laws to be expected in the organism is taken straight out of uh, Schrodinger's famous book, What is Life? that started molecular biology. Uh, of course, uh, once we discovered DNA and so on, it wasn't thought that we needed anything more. Um, uh, but much earlier, and I, I love this book, it's a wonderful book on the history of uh, science and uh, the world of Isaac Newton, in a letter to Oldenburg, who I think was president of the Royal Society or something, he said, the power of life and will by which animals move their bodies with great and lasting force demonstrate that there has to be other undiscovered laws of motion. That's, I think, a phenomenal statement. <laughs> um, then what are the new laws of? Uh, the inspiration here is uh, uh, from Howard Petit, an eminent theoretical biologist. I do not see any way to avoid the problem of coordination and still understand the physical basis of life. That's to say, uh, in order for selection, natural selection and so on to work, there needs to be something for it to work on and uh, uh, basic coordination is required here. This is going to be the self-organizing aspect. So what are the new laws of? There are laws of coordination. And this is a, 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 an old book, uh, but it has sort of the gist of this uh, dynamic patterns of self-organization of brain and behavior. It's a, a framework for understanding how the parts and processes of living things come together and break apart. It describes, explains, and predicts how patterns of behavior form, and they adapt, persist, change in the nervous system. Deals with coordination at multiple levels, addresses coordination within a part of the system between different parts and between different kinds of systems. And a key aspect is this idea of informational coupling, which the data uh, are really very clear on. Now, uh, just again, I won't go through all this, but just to make some distinctions here between the normal mechanical view uh, of uh, our understanding and what coordination dynamics is about. Uh, classical mechanics deals with machines, inanimate, uh, motion versus coordination, matter versus sort of the organization of matter. Forces, of course, as opposed to information exchange and couplings, fundamental dimensions as opposed to uh, these collective variables or order parameters. It's uh, coordination dynamics will be spatial temporal. It's uh, not linear, it's essentially nonlinear. It's bifurcations full of bifurcations, multi and metastability. Uh, it, the fluctuations and variability play a key role. Uh, the dynamics are not uh, decomposable. One can make a very solid effort at that, but the dynamics are emergent, they're synergistic. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts and different too, and so on. These are, uh, uh, we deal with heterogeneous units and connectivity. Uh, there's no strict distinction. I'll just mention a little bit more about this, about micro versus macro and so on. Uh, these are extensible laws and so on. So, uh, you can check all of this out in an encyclopedia article in the Encyclopedia of Complexity and System Science, which I've just provided people. Unlike the laws of mechanics for inanimate motion, the, the new laws specify the flow of coordination states produced by functional synergies or coordinative structures. Synergies are, uh, are 
ubiquitous in biology. This is Robert Rosen in his lovely book, Life Itself. Uh, very few controls can manipulate a much larger number of configurational degrees of freedom are everywhere in biology as they are in any constrained mechanism. In biology, they're indicators of complexity. So synergies are the uh, essential idea here. Uh, why synergies? Because they solve three big problems. One is uh, uh, the notion of degeneracy, that the same outcome can be achieved in many ways using combinations of different components. And this is seen at every observable level of description, by the way, from the genetic to the social. Uh, multifunctionality that different outcomes can be achieved using the same components, if you think about it, is a normal part of our uh, everyday behavior. The synergy is a functional entity. Uh, that's to say, uh, this was Rosen's point too, that where physics, physics doesn't give you a theory of function. That's where biology and uh, the life sciences come in. And we've, th that's what makes them in a sense more fundamental than physics. And of course the degrees of freedom problem, which I mentioned with the Rosen quote, synergies are functional groupings of elements temporarily constrained to act as a single unit. And really this research now on the degrees of freedom problem in the field, for example, which uh, I was probably most involved in of motor control and coordination uh, goes back well into the seventies. The hallmarks of these synergies are remote compensation. Any unexpected perturbation is immediately compensated, not just by the structure that's perturbed, but by remotely linked members of the synergy. And that's to preserve, as it were, the system's integrity or to accomplish a task. Uh, 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 an aspect of synergies that's been largely forgotten has to do with relational invariance, that is, that you can scale up these synergies and they preserve their internal relations up to a point. And the key properties are that they're not hardwired in a way, they're softly assembled, they're flexible yet stable, they're context sensitive. And in certain uh, fields of evolutionary biology, they are the proposed unit of selection. The current unit of analysis, which you'll hear a lot more about in the wonderful work of Grillner and colleagues and is, the, is the circuit, which is after all an engineering idea, it's a machine idea or network. Uh, here's uh, the famous lamprey that Sten has worked on and one of his quotes, uh, which he'll no doubt modulate <laughs> after speaking, after I speak, but, but uh, it's, it's a very uh, salient, uh, Quotation, although knowledge of interneuron conductivity, types of synaptic transmission and membrane properties is required for an understanding of central pattern generators, which I believe is the best place to, to look for this connection between brain and behavior. It is not in itself sufficient. The many interactive processes on the subcellular, cellular, and network levels are dynamic and complex. And of course, uh, you have to bring in the energetic aspects, the environment, and learning and all of that is all on top of this. So uh, it's not the, a purely reductionist uh, attitude uh, is, is likely to be insufficient. What would be the connection of synergies to circuits? Well, one is that the circuits now uh, are multifunctional. These are multifunctional pattern generating circuits. Uh, there's variability of anatomy, for example, in the caloric ganglion and the stomatogastric ganglion uh, pleuric neurons in the lobster, there's a sizable variation in the anatomy. Uh, similar single neuron and circuit performance can arise from widely disparate values of membrane and synaptic conductances. Same outcome can be achieved. Degenerate circuit function is now uh, the normal mode of discussion. Entirely different circum circuit mechanisms can account for the same change in circuit behavior. So there's this degeneracy sitting there large as life. The conclusion is that these circuits are multifunctional, they're variable, they're degenerate. And I propose here, as it were, uh, that they're realizations of the more general concept of functional synergy or coordinative structure. And uh, a solution to this reconciliation, if you like, would be to view circuits as dynamical systems. And this is not my proposal, the people that do this work uh, such as Brigman and Kristen and so on, that have been working in the field of central pattern generators for their entire careers. 
uh, view circuits as dynamical systems. That's a key idea. So if you like uh, the, the reconciliation here between the understanding of circuits, qua synergies, and uh, dynamical systems, this is really in a way what we are after here. Their lawful expression will come from informational coupling, uh, self-organization, and so on. Uh, so what are the two forces that constitute these synergies? Uh, well, uh, one uh, has to do with self-organization. This is a quote from Robert Lachlan, Nobel laureate, some years ago. The most profound revolution in the study of matter in the last 20 years or so was a discovery of emergent physical phenomena regulated by higher order principles. More is different. Uh, these are some of these the main ideas in uh, dynamic patterns. In these complex open systems, patterns arise spontaneously in a self-organized fashion. There's no homunculus or feminicula in the machine. There's compositional complexity, very many components. There are nonlinear interactions and patterns can emerge under these conditions. They can be characterized then by a few uh, spatial temporal patterns, collective variables or order parameters. Internal or external parameters lead the system through these different kinds of patterns. They don't actually code for them. They don't prescribe them. Uh, a key aspect has to do with predictions that at these critical points, loss of stability is the mechanism, the dynamical mechanism, which gives rise to new patterns, switching between patterns. And there one can actually see uh, predicted features such as fluctuations, critical slowing, and so on, well established in the literature. And then the, the dynamics uh, kind of complex solutions. So the dynamics may be lower dimensional, but they have uh, complex, if you like, even complicated solutions that are still not being fully understood. Uh, so you get this sort of merge of compositional complexity through these nonlinear interactions leading to nonlinear dynamical behavior. This is kind of a little foundation. Uh, I won't go into this because there isn't time, but this is the famous Baynard convection effect, which is one of the sort of classical examples. You start off with many degrees of freedom. Uh, you heat it from below. This would be a fluid heated from below and cooled from above. There's a temperature gradient. And then the motion of the, the the fluid starts to become more regular. And if you're looking down from the top, you see these beautiful patterns. You can capture the motion of this many degree of freedom system only with the pattern variables, these spatial modes that have slow, so slow relaxation times. They, they carry all the information about the pattern. And this can be characterized then in terms of these collective variables. And you write the dynamics, the equations are then defined in terms of these uh, collective variables. And they give rise to, you know, honeycomb structures and so on. There are many, many books on pattern formation in nature that use these principles. So self-organization uh, has not, in general, been strongly taken up by uh, the field of neuroscience. It's not entirely uh, new or anything like that, uh, but it's not perhaps a, a dominant feature. It is in uh, coordination dynamics. This is one of the key concepts here that uh, you have many coordinating elements. Uh, they give rise to these collective uh, patterns under, under parametric change. But once these patterns start to form, they actually can influence the behavior of the elements. So there's this kind of interplay between upward causation, self-organizing processes, and downwards, this sort of uh, bottom up, top down, is, is this is really complementary. They're part of the same thing. Uh, the second main force, of course, is, has to do with selection. And you'll hear more about this, I suspect, in, in Stan's talk. Uh, I'm taking the arguments here from uh, John Maynard Smith and Zaf Mari. It's a very nice book by Peter Corning. Just to give you a, an example of this, this is from Game Theory, where you have uh, uh, two people with two oars rowing across a stream. And in this case, uh, if they stay coordinated, one can even loaf off, but they'll get across the stream. If you go to this case where they have one oar, if they do not cooperate, 
then they'll just go around in circles, okay? So this is the idea here. Uh, it places really cooperation as at least uh, as significant as competition, you know, survival of the fittest. Cooperation, uh, even beyond kin selection and all of that, is a crucial aspect here of forming synergies and selecting synergies. So synergistic selection is certainly part of the story. Um, uh, if cooperative interactions among two or more individuals uh, produce selectively advantageous synergistic effects for all parties, on average, the cooperating players may become a unit of selection. This is the tenet of this theory. Uh, so there, here you have these two main principles, one of course being self-organization, not so much discussed. The second being, of course, uh, selection, natural selection and evolutionary theory, which you'll hear a lot more about. Coordination states on any given level of description are defined in terms of these collective variables, and these have to be identified. And this is the program of research. How do you go about that? So uh, uh, I'm, I'm putting sort of your, you know, our metaphysics out front. That's to say, you know, what is it really about when you say it to understand something? Well, you choose a level of description and that's subjective, but it's informed. There's a skill to that and wisdom comes into it. Uh, it's not as if you're going to, you know, explain, as, as I used to say, Newton didn't give you the laws of motion for a falling leaf. You don't have to explain all the complications. The trick is to be really ecological, to really be like a Galilean experiment of rolling a ball down an inclined plane. You prune away all the complications but you keep the essentials. And this is, this is sort of the art of science, as it were. Uh, you use qualitative change to identify these relevant coordination variables and control parameters. There may be newer methods, you know, these machine learning methods and so on might be brought in here. There certainly have been plenty of uh, analysis methods over the years that, are, uh, that have been used as well to identify uh, more macroscopic variables the question has to do with their relevance and qualitative change here, which doesn't mean bad quantitative, by the way. Qualitative change is uh, a principal way, uh, if you can find these qualitative changes, to identify what's really relevant. The idea is that the variables that change qualitatively, with quantitative consequences, of course, are the ones that really matter for the system's function. Then you map these uh, variables onto the dynamics and study their stability and change. Uh, you identify the individual components and their dynamics if God is in her heaven. Uh, uh, and then, uh, then you can try to establish the relation between the two. So it's just kind of choose a level of description, get that clear, and then go one level down, study that, and then see if you can derive the macro, as it were, from the next level down. So a comment or two on that would be no level is more or less fundamental than any other. This top down, bottom up uh, versus bottom up, which people are get into, higher versus lower, macro, micro, these distinctions are not relevant in this picture. It's a kind of tripartite scheme. You go one level down, see if you can play the game at that level and then see if you can go back up again. And the linkage across levels of observation or descriptions by virtue of shared dynamics. See? That's a key point. Are behavior in the brain self-organized? If so, how would you know? Well, uh, the paradigm shift is instability. Uh, why an emphasis on, on qualitative change? It allows a clear distinction between one pattern and another. It allows you to identify these uh, collective variables and their dynamics, which are not known a priori. Uh, this is really important, I think, that these have to be experimentally identified. Near these critical points and so on, the essential processes govern pat governing a pattern stability and its flexibility and selection can be uncovered. That's a key benefit of promoting qualitative change. Uh, th this is uh, some old work of our own where you start off you know, with the finger movement paradigm. I'm, I'm assuming a lot of people already know this, so I'm not going to go into this. Uh, by the way, there's a retrospective uh, uh, paper in the last 
edition of Biological Cybernetics. The editors are celebrating the 60th year of Biological Cybernetics. And uh, this paper with these finger movements and the modeling of the so-called HKB, Hakan Kelter Bunt's model, is in there. But the experiments that promoted that model were finger movement experiments, where you can start the finger movements out anti-phase, let your fingers do the walking, as it were. You uh, uh, increase only one parameter, namely how fast you're moving. And what happens is that the system switches spontaneously to in-phase. And what you can see here is uh, um, this qualitative change with quantitative consequences. The measure is the relative phase. The relative phase, as you can see, fluctuates and then switches. As, and even though the system's going faster, it becomes less variable. Uh, you can measure these fluctuations and so on. So this has been established uh, you know, uh, uh, over many studies. Um, uh, where are the switches in this thing? You see switching occurs as a self-organized process. These phase transitions are signature features of self-organization. And they're seen in the brain too. This is work we did some years ago and there's been a lot of work since, but it shows you the same kind of thing. You're changing a parameter as you go from left to right here. These are the brain signals, and this is magnetoencephalography. These are the spectral properties of the, uh, of the signal. You can calculate, of course, frequencies and phases and amplitudes. This is the relative phase here. One of these is the behavior. So this sort of syncopation to synchronization or antiphase to in-phase. Uh, and the other is the brain. And you can see that in this case, they map very nicely onto each other. I think the black ones are the behavior. But so uh, you can see the phase relation is stable. Then you speed up. It shifts a little bit. There's a little bit of a, a perturbation when you change the parameter. And it comes back. And there's, you change the parameter again by the same amount. It comes back. It takes longer and longer to get back. And then the system switches. It kicks into another gear. And you can see that in both the brain and behavior. Uh, uh, this can be seen in large uh, ensembles of and, and large uh, uh, squid magnetometers. This is a more recent work done in Vienna with Luder Deka and so on, uh, with a large number of squids. You can identify these uh, phase transitions there as well. Many, many studies. Uh, uh, there are studies uh, using fMRI where you can actually, here's the behavior. So here is the more stable in-phase behavior as you change the parameter, it doesn't change very much. The anti-phase behavior is already more variable, but increases its variability as you approach the transition. And you see these brain regions that uh, for the uh, in-phase case, they don't change very much as the parameter changes, but the anti-phase case, they really light up. So the, the brain areas and this brain circuitry is directly related to, as it were, both the stability and the instability of the behavior. And there've been many studies in this. I just briefly mentioned that there's a corresponding theory about this. I didn't see Victor's talk, but uh, Victor Yursa uh, has done a number of uh, beautiful uh, theoretical papers as well as simulations showing these transitions and spatial temporal patterns of the brain with this neural field uh, theory, which has both cortical, cortical and intracortical connections, heterogeneous units and so on. Uh, this is just one example, uh, spatial temporal pattern formation in neural systems with heterogeneous connection topologies. So uh, that's a whole uh, area of science on its own. Uh, and I thought just for fun, I'd just mention this old work by von Holst in St. Paul. This is the chicken and there's brainstem stimulation, stimulation. And you can see that just by increasing the uh, brainstem uh, voltage, the, the, the stimulation into somewhere in the brainstem, I'm not, I don't remember exactly which part. I'll, I'll show you another slide uh, that, that does say where. But uh, you can see that this, the point here is that just by increasing the, the uh, stimulus strength, the stimulation, electrical stimulation into the, uh, the brainstem, you take the, the, the chicken through a whole series of behaviors. You know? um, so 
It's very simple parametric control producing really complicated behaviors. That's just to, as a message here. Uh, this is with humans here uh, in five people that are getting a uh, deep brain stimulation uh, to induce mood change. And this is in the nucleus accumbens region. Uh, and uh, these are psychometric scores about uh, how the people feel. And of course, at low voltages, they're, uh, you know, quite anxious. But at a critical, I mean, they, they, this is not analyzed this way, by the way, but the way I would look at this is that there, the, as you increase the voltage here, you're actually changing the behavior from being anxious to relaxed and easy, you see. So you're just taking the system into euphoric uh, states of mind with a simple parametric change in the, um, in this case, the nucleus accumbens region with deep brain stimulation. And the corresponding psychometric scores show that, you know, you're initially uh, very anxious and so on, but you actually just at a certain voltage, you become, uh, feels great, uh, but too much. And of course there are lots of, it's like getting high and so on. So uh, these are real uh, behavioral uh, states of mind here that are changing as a result of very simple parametric stimulation. Highly nonlinear, I suspect, but of course not analyzed as such. All right. Um, so why is this phase transitions important here? Uh, there are expressions of self-organization in the brain. Self-organization now is used as a buzzword, but actually to establish that there's actually self-organization, you need to really use these phase transitions to establish that. They're indicators of emergent collective behavior of very large numbers of neurons. So that's a key point, actually, that we're dealing here typically. I mean, even, even to get a signal with a very, you know, at the, at the level of femtotesla with the, with the magnetoencephalography, you have to have about 10,000 neurons that are synchronized. So synchrony is playing a, a, a real role here. But it, this is suggesting here that there are these principles of self-organization that are dealing with very large collectives of neurons. Switching is occurring without switches, you know, so the, the, this is a, a takeoff of, a, there was a, a, an article or a book on where are the switches in this thing. And in fact, uh, phase transitions are, are being now used in, uh, by people like Stanislav Tehain and Jean-Pierre Changeu as a mechanism of what they call global ignition of conscious states that from a sort of resting state brain, uh, the, the system under certain circumstances goes into this globally ignited state. And uh, that's viewed mostly metaphorically at the moment, but I think quite seriously by these people and others as a phase transition. All right. Um, uh, coordination states on a given level of description are defined in terms of collective variables that typically span traditional boundaries. Uh, uh, and I think th this would be a way into what I'm going to call you call here the origins of agency. What is this I? Um, uh, I love this uh, quote by Maxine Sheets Johnston. When we look and uh, hear infants directly, we look out on animate forms of life that are similarly engaged bodies. In doing so, so we see and hear not embodied minds, but mindful bodies or uh, uh, that create or, or are in the process of learning to create synergies of meaningful movement. Uh, here's a baby here. And above the baby is a mobile uh, that the baby likes to look at when the mobile moves. If I can run this, you can see the baby. We've got the baby here uh, instrumented with sensors to monitor the baby's movements. And the baby likes the mobile okay uh, when it's not coupled to the mobile. Now, if you, if you attach a ribbon to the mobile from the baby's foot, what you see here, I hope, is that the baby uh, starts to move the mobile. The baby, as it were, starts to control the mobile. Uh, when you decouple the baby from the mobile again, the baby actually continues to kick for a while as if it's expecting the mobile to move, 
And then after a while, it just uh, gives up. So just watch this again, if you like. So there's the baby watching the mobile. It's uncoupled. So it's capable of spontaneous movement. This is a four month old. These are 15 four month olds by my student, Elisa Sloan. Then you couple with a ribbon uh, to the mobile movement. And the baby suddenly realizes this is me. I am making this move, right? That's the idea. And we're going to have electrodes in the brain of, in the uh, baby's head as well, EEG. And then this uncoupling phase. So that's the three stage uh, aspect of this experiment. Um, uh, I think this gets at the whole point of uh, agency here that uh, the, the baby is making something happen in the world and it does this by virtue of coupling its own movements to the mobile, okay? I have a kind of a, uh, so this collective variable uh, uh, signals a shift from, as it were, meaningless to meaningful. Uh, and this is an idealization. So uh, these are just the paths, the trajectories of the foot, and the mobile, and they're uncorrelated. Right. But then the baby suddenly realizes, ah, no, this is me. I'm making this move. And it goes into this highly coordinated state. This is an idealization. The real data are better captured by correlations. Um, there is both the theory of this with, done with my late friend Armin Fuchs in biological cybernetics and a general article on the self organizing origins of agency. But the idea is that this emergence of self. This little self uh, is, a, is, a, is a phase transition. It's a disorder to order phase transition in the dynamics. And the key quantities have to do with the foot mobile, the organism environment, the body environment. That's what's wrapping up the coordination here. And that's what's telling us, as it were, aha, uh, this is a Eureka. This is me. It's me that's moving this mobile, not some external force. Uh, the laws, of course, are expressed in the language of informationally coupled dynamical systems. Uh, they work for the hands, the fingers, coupling to metronomes, sensory stimuli, different uh, body parts, multiple body parts, two people coordinating with each other. Uh, There's your rhythmical movements. You're talking really about the space of oscillators and coupling. This is for one brain. This is for two brains, uh, the basic features, two stable modes at low rates, in-phase and anti-phase, anti-phase stability decreases with increasing rate, anti-phase switches to in-phase, no switch from in-phase. Uh, if you start out in in-phase and there's strong hysteresis. So these are the basic features that are observed and they can be described here with a mathematical model. I'll show you that next just calling it the coordination potential because it applies to all these different cases where you're looking here at the coupling strength, which in these experiments often corresponds to a driving frequency or something like that. And uh, it's fun the plot here is a function of the uh, heterogeneity or the diversity between the components. So there's two factors, the diversity between the components and the coupling strength. The top line, is where this diversity, this delta omega equals zero. And this is called the HKB model. Uh, and you can see it starts off with stable states, two stable states, minima of the gradient uh, dynamics. As you change the coupling, uh, the, uh, the state near antiphase loses stability and then jumps into this in phase state. The dynamics are rather more subtle when you start to manipulate the heterogeneity of the components. You see these shifts in where the fixed points, which are correspond to coordination states, where these fixed points are, uh, uh, these shifts occur. And if you actually make the, uh, the component differences larger, you actually see this introduces a tilt in the potential. And what actually, you, you actually see that all the fixed points, whether they're stable, the black dots, or the unstable ones, they all disappear. And you're left actually just with still wrinkles in this potential, still tendencies to where the fixed points used to be. That's a key concept here. 
so the coordination states are, have stability, but these tendencies are still seen in experiments. In fact, they're ubiquitous in experiments, where there's actually no real stable states at all, but just tendencies. Uh, I need to move here. This metastability property is uh, dominant. This is sort of a basic building block here, where you have the individual diversity, you have the coupling, you have it's non-deterministic, you have fluctuations. Here is the same picture, the collected variable, uh, the derivative of that plotted against itself gives you the layout of the fixed points, the coordination states. You can see the black dots, the slope is negative. And these are the fixed points. These are coordination states. Where well, the slope is positive, these are unstable or repelling fixed points. And you can see you've got this multi-stability initially, coexistence of equally valid alternatives. Uh, then there are transitions. The antiphase state disappears entirely. And then both states disappear. And that's where you still get the tendencies. The tendencies still exist, but there are no longer any states. See? So uh, neuroscientists would refer to this, uh, these coordinated states as integrated, coordinated synchronized states. There's transitions from one kind of coordination to another. But here you've actually got both a tendency to integrate for the parts to come together and a tendency for the parts to express themselves. That's this autonomy of the parts. So the whole thing has to be seen really as uh, coexisting uh, aspects of the dynamics. Uh, you can see this in two people. You can see this people interacting with machines and so on. Need to move quickly here. Uh, just uh, let me uh, show you the kinds of things you would see in real data. If the system's uncoupled and you're looking at uh, this variable, the relative phase, you can see it just wanders straight through. There's no evidence that it's going to settle down anywhere. If you've got stability, uh, that's what it means. State, a state is uh, stable by definition. You've, you, the system stays in one state uh, throughout time. And then this metastable dynamic, this dwell escape dynamic, this relatively coordinated state where the system stays together and then drifts and then comes back. This is the situation where there's actually no stable or unstable states at all, just coexisting tendencies. Coexisting tendencies for the, the parts to come together at the same time as the parts want to express their uh, individuality or their autonomy. And of course, these kinds of dynamics can be seen in other uh, situations. Uh, this is called the chimera, uh, after the mythological creature with the, the head of a lion and the body of a goat and the tail of a serpent. Uh, but uh, uh, this is a different kind of dynamics, but it, it nevertheless it makes the same point that you have regimes where you have the coexistence of uh, stable states and unstable. They're both, there's a tendency to trap and a tendency to wrap uh, that can be seen. And this was discovered actually uh, in this paper by uh, Kuramoto. And I'll come back to Kuramoto in a, in a, in a minute. Uh, this can be seen in real data. I'm showing you, uh, in this case, electroencephalography data uh, where uh, there's metastable ensembles. You can see that some stay together and others are independent, but you get both tendencies going on at the same time in real data. This is what uh, we call a metastable brain, as it were. And the mechanism of uh, coordination here, there's now people, a lot of people talking about this. Uh, and these were studies that were done, for example, between two brains where you can see these signatures of interbrain coordination, as well as intra-brain coordination, uh, and metastable phase attraction between neural ensembles over multiple frequency bands. This is kind of the, the, the picture that people are focusing on, and it's extremely interesting. Um, uh, let me just make a remark or two. Now I'm nearing the end. Uh, the new laws to be expected in the organism apply to the coordination of very many things, just a few things and everything in between. And this is very recent work, reconciling the many and the few and the in-between. 
this is uh, Kuromoto, the Kuromoto model. And this is Art Winfrey and Stephen Strogatz, who have really, uh, uh, I, I, I would say, popularized the Kuromoto model as well as studied it. And uh, uh, I won't be able to tell you. Well, the, these are the. This is this is the issue in terms of scaling things up. Uh, the Kuromoto model is being used for. Uh, neural network synchronization, connectivity measures, chemical oscillations, his ori original uh, uh, work there, social coordination, this is a crowd going into a coherent state of applause, heart cells, fireflies, communication networks, very, very dominant model for uh, synchronization in multi-degree of freedom systems. Here's our extended HKB that we've talked about, humans coordinating with sensory stimuli, with the same person between persons, uh, also in the brain between humans and machine. So, uh, how do we reconcile the Kuromoto and the extended HKB model? Uh, uh, just to show you the, Kuro, the the basis of the Kuromoto model is that at some critical coupling, the system goes from incoherent to coherent. This is a this is and statistical mechanics is known as a phase transition, and it's given by an order parameter which is the amplitude of the phase vector, collective amplitude, uh, the larger that is, the more order you have. And that's what's being plotted here. You can see that it's low order, there's no synchrony, and then suddenly there's this transition at a critical value of the coupling. Uh, so uh, that here we have the Kuromoto model for large scale collective dynamics. Here's the extended HKB for small scale dynamics. Uh, what about in between? And this is where uh, uh, Mengsun Zhang, who uh, was, did her doctoral work on this and then went to Stanford, and I think now is the University of North Carolina. Anyway, uh, Mengsun uh, really got into this whole issue, uh, did experiments. I won't be able to tell you the details of these experiments because I, I'm running out of time, but I will give you the references. Uh, all of this is published. Uh, the key idea was you have eight people. so. Uh, to get at the reconciliation, you have to go in between. You can't go to the full ensemble, you know, large scale statistical ensemble, not, not to just two uh, kind of dyadic situations as most of the HKB modeling has, uh, uh, has operated on. This is in between with eight people and it's a very simple task. Uh, uh, you can look at between groups, that's the red and the blue guys, uh, as well as within a group between the within the red guys and the blue the blue guys, and simply what happens here is uh, they see uh, both their own taps and a little uh, LED display that displays what others are doing. They're not told how to coordinate; it's all as it were spontaneous. The manipulation is that you pace each person at a given frequency. Uh, for about 10 seconds, and then you let them free run for about 50 seconds. And you can pace them, of course, at different frequencies. And here are the different frequencies. You can pace them at the same frequency, at this delta frequency is zero, at different frequencies, uh, and you can manipulate the magnitude of the frequency difference. So that's if you get the gist of the experiment. Uh, and actually, this has been studied in detail in terms of brains as well. Uh, I'll show you just I don't think I can get into some of these details, but you see uh, here are, this is the array of people. And you see in this case, three and four are coordinating quite nicely and then they switch. But because of the interrelation between uh, the, the elements, there's also a connection between one and three, not just three and four. See one and three is actually behaving in this metastable way. They're dwell, escape, dwell, escape. And uh, actually, when you really look at the interaction between these three elements, you see that uh, they're, inter they're, they're affecting each other, that the longer this guy, uh, one and three dwell with each other, the more effect it has on three and four. And so you can pick up this uh, relational dynamics in a very pretty way. You see, um, uh, so, uh, more is different here. Uh, uh, you have to look at these relations, of course. 
just to uh, show you the overall picture, if, if, if you look at the uh, within group coordination, you can see that both in phase and anti phase are there, regardless of the frequency difference between the components. Between the groups, however, you see the, the main effect again that uh, they're very good. Uh, there's, a, there's an anti phase state when there's only, uh, when there's no difference between the frequencies of the components. And that anti phase state disappears as the frequency difference gets greater. So this is on the, the overall probability distribution. Now, to reconcile the two, uh, I, I, I don't think I have the time to go through this. Here's the human behavior, which you can see uh, the, as a function of the frequency difference. This antiphase starts to disappear as the frequency difference increases. The classical Kuromoto model, however, has no antiphase. It doesn't have metastability. It just has this, uh, this incoherent to coherent transition which is always in phase. In fact, people have talked about anti-synchronization and so on, but synchronization actually can occur at different phases. So here's the Kuramoto model and you see it doesn't do very well with the human behavior, but the generalization, this generalized HKB model does quite nicely. It shows you the anti-phase as well as the in-phase or the anti-phase sort of disappears uh, as a function of the frequency difference. So the bottom line is, that uh, uh, the followers of Kuramoto, as it were, stress the incoherent to coherent synchronization. There's no buyer multi-stability. There's no order order transitions, metastability, which are essential features of the extended HKB. This middle ground experiment shows that these, these essential features are crucial aspects of the dynamics. Therefore, the middle ground is captured fully by this generalized HKB model and uh, there's a recent paper that, that gets into that in detail. Uh, I uh, think in the interest of time, I will drop this last part, uh, which actually was aiming to talk about uh, the modification of the dynamics. This is a metaphorical inspiration by Sporns and Edelman, where you're in some space of variables where you have the primary uh, movement repertoire, and you can see these sort of densities reflect that. And over time, you, you see that there's three and it goes to two and then goes back to three. So there's this continuous sort of dynamical changes with development, which you can also see in real experiments. Um, and uh, that there's really a key point here that people come in with their own dispositions and we call that intrinsic dynamics. So before learning, uh, some people come in and they are able to produce in-phase and anti-phase. Uh, and others come in where they're able to produce, inf, you know, intermediate patterns. So they're tri-stable. These guys are bi-stable, but that's their initial repertoire. And then with learning, if you have them learn, for example, the guys who come in with bi-stable dynamics, you can have them learn something in between. And what you see then is a phase transition between bi-stable and tri-stable. They, they, they retain their previous intrinsic dynamics and they add a new pattern. Whereas the guys that come in as tri-stable, they just shift. So this is a smooth shift mechanism, and this is a bifurcation mechanism. So there's two ways to learn here in this picture, depending on, this is the key point, depending on the pre-existing repertoire. So that's, I think, a point that's coming in strongly in all kinds of personalized medicine situations and so on. This just says what I just said here. There's a bifurcation mechanism and there's a shift smooth linear mechanism. And uh, uh, great, I'm uh, practically finished now. I'm coming back to the uh, idea that uh, this coordination dynamics uh, has these two factors, components and couplings. And uh, uh, when you go into the metastable regime, you see that you have actually a bunch of complementary pairs individual and collective parts and whole, segregation, integration, choice and chance, competition and cooperation, linear, non-linear, symmetry, broken symmetry, stability, instability, states, tendencies. These are actually complementary. And this little squiggle system, the tilde, exposes the basic truth of the matter that when you're in this metastable regime of the dynamics, which is ubiquitous, um, 
you see these aspects not as contraries at all, but as complementary. So the tilde or the squiggle symbol expresses a basic truth that both complementary aspects and their dynamics are required for understanding and that one without the other focus say on the individual versus the collective, a focus on segregation, for example, versus integration, a focus on competition versus cooperation, but one without the other, the understanding is incomplete. So uh, coordination dynamics is just a brief summary, reconciles the inanimate and the animate with these dynamics, the many, the few, and the in-between, the spontaneous self-organizing, this is the baby work and the directed intentional aspect. So thank you. And these are my colleagues, uh, uh, Herman Hocken, of course, Guillaume Duma, the, the ones in yellow have contributed most to this presentation, Victor Yersa, of course, David Engstrom, Manuel Tognoli, Vivian Kostrubiak, uh, uh, Elisa Sloan, and uh, Pierre-Georges Zanon. So uh, all of them have played a very significant part in uh, revealing these postulates of a theory of coordination. So I'll stop there.